Giovanni, you're a very well put together man. I mean, listener, you can't see Gio, or if you're if you're watching the video, you might. But he has he in his pictures, he has a three piece suit, a clean shaven head, and an exquisitely trimmed beard. But Gio, I have to ask you something. What do you think of bringing back the curls? Ah, I love the question because uh, I have probably this happens now a handful of times a year uh, when I'm working with medtech startups and the CEOs who I had a phone call with, a Zoom call with, whatever it may be, they'll send me the link or they'll send me a screenshot and be like, what is this? And it's me with all those curls on. And um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to get it out there and I, I'm going to speak as transparently as possible on this one and demystify that story. So COVID had, had just set in and we all were working from home and, and in, we live in Florida. So we were known as that ultra liberal state when it came to COVID. So I think we had two and a half, three maximum weeks of what we really considered as a lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people were out and about and coming over people's houses after that. And it kind of loosened up pretty quickly down here, at least. Mm -hmm. So this was, I think, May-ish, May or June, something like that. But the world of podcasts being started by people who never had run podcasts before, et cetera, was just everyone had a podcast and running out of the woodworks with it. And my friend, who happened to live down the street, he's a high school teacher at Boca High. He wanted to start a podcast. And, um, and it wasn't even one over zoom. It was, it was, he wanted to do it in person. So we had all this microphone equipment, et cetera. But my friend isn't necessarily known for, um, always being on time. And so, you know, that morning it was a super hot day already in Florida. And he was telling me that he was going to be late. And I was just like, this may not even happen today. It's a Sunday. I'm going to go out and enjoy this Sunday with my wife. Um, and so it must have been June and it was super hot out. So we, we started walking around and it was a beautiful day and walking toward the beach and stuff. And there's this beer store and I'm like, Hey, let's go grab a few beers. And we went in there and so, you know, beer plus hot heat and sun doesn't always equal the best, yeah. best uh, idea. And so. I get back home and it's just like a Sunday afternoon. I'm feeling great. I can answer the questions. I know what the, the questions are going to be. It's just going to be about life and inspiration and all that good stuff, which I, I believe I pulled off. Um, but before I even came over to the house, I, I'm bald. So all of you who can't actually see me right now, and if you do see me on the video, wherever you're listening to this podcast, you'll realize I'm bald. But if you can't see me, I am bald. Um, and I have this collection of wigs at my house. I, I've planned through... Um, all of, all of Halloween, I have a new wig. And so each year I have a new wig. And if you look at my closet, I have this collection of wigs. And, you know, I had a few beers and it was fun. It was a Sunday afternoon and my friend wasn't over my house yet. And I ended, I, I put on, and I think one of my friends was watching a soccer game, which ultimately inspired me. And so I ended up getting this wig and I put it on and I completely forgot that I had it on. And my friend comes over for this podcast and I, and he's like, do you want to take off the wig? And, you know, I was first of all, and then I was like, no, I don't want to take off the wig. And, and I have, I think I even poured myself a glass of wine too. At the same time, and I'm telling a podcast to a group of high school students, or at least that's what it was meant for. And so I'm like, no, I'm going to leave the wig on. And I did this whole podcast and I thought it was audio. And I, I this was like a best friend of mine. I mean, this is, imagine, you know, a guy, best friend where you just, that's who it was. So I felt very comfortable and I left the huge pro curl wig on and I did this podcast. And when he released it, it was released with video. And apparently it went viral, which started off in the local community down here, um, which then brought up its SEO and, and then it brought itself really attached to my name. So if you Google my name, that's what ends up happening is showing up with me in this curly wig on. And now I have medical device CEOs about a handful of times a year screenshot me in a curly wig saying, is this you? And this is actually the person that I'm working with. And uh, that's my story. Well, I have to admit, it's, it's, a, it's a magnificent wig. 
<laughs> this is a magnificent way. I mean, if I had that much fur above my shoulders between my beard, and once again, if you can't see me, I do have a big beard. I just have a bald head. Um, if I had that magnificent wig as real hair and my beard, um, I would be the firmest caveman out there, and I would love it, but I don't. Well, I mean, I, I just have to look forward to uh, maybe future uh, times where we run together where you may or may not be uh, wearing that wig, and I really hope you do. But uh, <laughs> listener, uh, back on track, my name's Jeff, and I'm the host of How It's Met, the podcast where we chat with people who are shaping the future of healthcare. Uh, here we learn about the stories and secrets of the amazing people who are making it possible for everyone to live happier, healthier, longer life. With me today is the magnificently non-wigged today, Gio Loricella, co-founder and managing partner of Lifeblood Capital. And you've interviewed quite a few founders. So Gio, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Uh, today's a good day. And I had so far amazing conversations with significantly smarter people than I, which is what keeps me going. And nothing to complain about. Today's a good day. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're in a great mood because there's plenty that we got a deep dive into today. So, I mean, just to go straight into it, um, you're basically the guy who finds people and money for companies in health tech. Um, but you weren't always Mr. MedTech, again, referencing one of the podcasts that you've been on. Uh, in fact, you started in snowy Buffalo, New York. So what brought you down to Florida? Uh, snowy Buffalo, New York. That's fine. Um, so I, I was born and raised in Buffalo. And uh, I, my first day of high school, they gave this big inspirational speech where they said, you know, you have this next four years ahead of you and it's yours to win or lose. And whatever you do with this next four years allows you to know where you can go after that. Um, and if you get a scholarship to a university or you decide to get accepted into a university, it could be anywhere. And I was like, I can leave Buffalo. And so it was just my mission and goal. I put my head down. I mean, I was always a partier, by the way. But I was always that guy who could straddle both where my best friends were the all constantly in trouble people. Um, the ones that constantly tested their parents and the school system and all that. Those were the people who I hung out with. Uh, but the pocket protecting nerds, four eyes, people who had pencils in their front pockets, all that stuff. That's who I hung out with from the morning until I got back on the school bus. And so I could actually structure both groups pretty well. And I always loved school. I mean, I, I loved partying, but I actually genuinely did love school. And so I just made it my mission that I was going to leave Buffalo at the end of the four years and I had an opportunity to get out. I will tell you, um, for all those who may either have a connection to Buffalo or currently in Buffalo who are listening to this or watching this, uh, I never looked back when I left Buffalo for years. Um, I, I went down to Miami and I didn't come back. Um, but what I will say is I have now since visited Buffalo and my family's still there. I mean, I, my immediate family's still there and I have never had more of a profound respect for Buffalo, New York. And if you ever go there, if you're a foodie, if you want architectural history, if you want to see the Niagara Falls, I mean, I can tell you, you could avoid it for a few months a year. Uh, so that's an obvious, we get a lot of snow and it's pretty gray, not great winters. Um, amazing summers gorgeous autumns and you know i have more respect for buffalo now than i ever have and uh it was a great place to be born and raised and a great place to go back to yeah and i mean you did eventually as as you are in right now in florida make it out of buffalo new york uh but you did a finance degree but then i was looking at your linkedin and you got this conspicuous gap in your education between 2009 and 2013 and you told me this fascinating story of what happened during those four-ish years off the air. Do you mind recounting some of what happened during that gap? Yeah. Ah, so graduated a semester early from university, did it in three and a half years, graduated in December, 2009, which I was down here in Florida and you know, there has been, this is now January, 2023. Sorry if I'm dating the podcast, if that's okay. But it's January, 2023. And what I will tell you is, um, I moved down here in 2006 and Florida was really, really known. I mean, Miami was still obviously a city, but Miami, 
South Florida was known for either retirement or heavily based on tourism. Obviously, there's exceptions. There's societies that have existed on here for a while, but it, as a whole, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. It's not like the Bay Area that you think of or now Texas or Dallas or Boston or Chicago or New York. Um, but it was really like this tropical getaway where it was almost like snowbirds came in November, snowbirds left in May. And what happened between May and November was almost a lot of nothing. And so outside of Miami, at least going north and ultimately graduating in 2009 during the height of a massive recession, depression, there was no opportunity for even college graduates. And so my last semester of university, I had a very, very good friend of mine who I know throughout all of my university years. And so he was an older gentleman and he was looking to retire and he didn't know how I was a finance major, as you had mentioned, I, my last summer starting in May of 2009 until I think the mid of August when right before I went back to my last semester, I locked myself in a room, um, because my friend who wanted to look to retire had a guy who was a self-sustaining financial analyst and trader self-taught. He was originally from China, actually brilliant human being. And that's how he made his living. He was just a day trader and made a lot of money doing so. And I was a finance major and I wanted to learn how to put my craft and, and my education to work. And he taught me how to read charts, financial charts. And I never really try to do anything completely half-assed, to be honest, if I could say that on this podcast. So I'm either going to throw myself all the way in it, or I'm not going to do it. And I'm very focused in whenever I do something. So I had nothing going on. I wasn't going back to Buffalo that summer. And I locked myself in a room in West Palm beach for two and a half, three months. And I just studied and studied and studied and studied and studied all these financial charts and I think it was the very beginning of August, uh, my friend, I, I still can't believe I'm even telling this because all these years later, I'm like, why would you ever do that? But he ended up giving me $50,000 to day trade on his behalf. What? In fact, yeah, shit, exactly. I, I mean, I thought it was so normal because I, I actually did see him a lot and spent a lot of time with him and he was like a. A, an uncle, father figure, brother figure. He was everything. He was just, he was a really, really good, my, my, probably like one of my second major mentors after my papa. And, um, and so he, yeah, that's what he did. And he gave me this $50,000 account and he's like, go trade it. And I think it was like three weeks or something like that. Three weeks or it was, I know it was shy of a month, but it might've been closer to a month. I turned his $50,000 into over three quarters of a million. Oh. And, um, and it was just, it was, it was arduous day trading though. It was capitalizing on everything. It was, I don't, I definitely couldn't do it right now ever again, but it was ridiculous. And it was something I got out of a movie. And so he goes, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go re uh, retire. And where do I go retire? I want to make sure all my money is capable of being stretched throughout the rest of my years. I mean, he was at that time, he was still in his very early fifties. Right? Still got a lot more time to go. And so he goes, I'm going to go retire, I think in Costa Rica. I'm like, okay, great. So we go down to Costa Rica and I end up going down there with him within three days. We were there for a week. Within three days, he realizes that he's not ever going to move to Costa Rica because it's significantly more Spanish speaking than he ever thought. He heard all these things about all these American expats moving to Costa Rica, et cetera. And he's like, where are they all? I mean, we met a few, but I can't speak Spanish and I'm not going to live here for the next 30 years of my life. And I'm, not, I'm too old to even learn speaking Spanish. So I'm not going to do it. So we just enjoyed the rest of the time. And I think it was the last night we were in town, we were at a bar and drinking. And he goes, I never really asked you how you turned $50,000 into three quarters of a million. I never even asked you. I just, we just did it and went on. How did you do it? And so I just started telling the story and it was like, as soon as I finished telling the story, 
there was a guy behind me who actually was an American expat who at the time was living in the Philippines. He was a commercial builder. And he turns to me and he goes, would you ever move to Costa Rica and do you want a job? And I'm in the middle of a recession. I'm a finance major. I know that there's nothing waiting for me in Florida. And I said, yeah, I would. I would love to, and I would love to move to Costa Rica. And if that's my job, then I'll take it. So um, I graduated on December 19th, 2009. December 21st, 2009, I was on a plane to Costa Rica. Uh, and when I arrived, I, because he had, was living in the hotel that he had bought and he was going to be building all these other buildings and I was going to be the project manager for all the construction that this guy was going to be developing in Costa Rica. I show up to the hotel. I've told, you know, my family, my friends, everyone back in the States, like, love you all, graduated college, I'm moving to Costa Rica. <laughs> show up to the hotel and I see the woman who's behind the desk, which I saw a few weeks prior when I was there just to visit. And I go, where's Mike? I'm here. And she goes, no one told you? Like, what are you talking about? Mike died two weeks ago. And I didn't have a contract in place. I didn't have anything. And I had, I think, I don't know, $1,200 for my name or whatever it was at the time. It was not much. And I lit, I mean, she goes, I'll let you stay here tonight. But after that, I have to start charging you. And so what I thought was a plan was completely gone. And um, there was a, a, a very famous expat bar that was maybe a five minute walk called the sports mineral away from this hotel in downtown, um, the, 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 the capital of, of Costa Rica, which of course, right now I'm telling you the story and I live there. I'm blanking on right now. Ten one. I'm forgetting anyway. Um, and I run into one of the guys that Mike, the guy who died had introduced to me previously. And this guy was an expat from Seattle and he was running a nonprofit company living in Costa Rica. I think at the time it was already like four or five years that he was there. And I tell him this crazy story and he goes, I can't pay you, but I can give you room and board. I, I live in this place up in the mountains up in Heredia. Um, and if you want to stay and have a job and I can give you experience, I just can't pay you and I'll, I'll even feed you. And I'm like, I'm not going back home. And this sounds like at least like something to keep me here for a little while. Let's figure it out. I did that for six months. I showed up to work one day and it was an amazing experience, by the way. I mean, I got to travel all over Costa Rica. I got to meet the president of Costa Rica. Um, we were helping out preserve the natural ecosystems within Costa Rica. And we did all these partnerships with Indonesia and other rain, oh, the, the Brazilian rainforests, et cetera. So that's what we were doing. And it was really interesting. And then, um, one day I show up to work like I normally do, and that guy disappeared, and I never saw him again. I'm like, what? I'm not supposed to be here. I got to go back home. So I go back home. I go to my parents' condo in West Palm Beach, and there's a friend who I knew there previously for me moving to Costa Rica, who was from Colombia, and we started a company fast forwarding a bunch. I went down to Colombia. We started this company, which was in medical tourism. I'll make this story much shorter than I that I was planning on, um, we ended up creating this company. We needed approval by the Colombian health cluster. And it was like out of a movie. Um, I pitched the company and then someone walked over the door in Medellin, Colombia and locked the door and then said, we're buying your company. Um, you're not going to launch it. We're going to launch it. And then there's no negotiating power at that point. I mean, I'm like, okay. Uh, they wrote me a check for $20,000 and they bought me an airplane ticket back. And that was my Colombian story. So then now I'm like, okay, Central and South America. I play that out. I'm good. I'm in West Palm. This is now sometime in late 2000 and that was 2000, early 2011. Um, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing now. I mean, I, I, and I love school. So I said, okay, fine. We're still somewhat in the recession. It's not a lot of great opportunities. Still in Florida. I've had these experiences over the past year and a half ish. Um, I'm going to apply to university of Miami and get my PhD. I got accepted into Miami for my PhD in international economics. And the program didn't start for like five or six months. So I'm like, do what you love. What do you love? I said, I love coffee. So I ended up working at the West Palm beach 
Starbucks and Rod Stewart used to show up regularly and I would make Rod Stewart a latte. And I thought this was a very temporary situation because I was going to do my PhD. I thought I had my next five years of my life locked up. And about a month and a half before I started my PhD program, I got a letter in the mail saying that because of the recession, depression, whatever you want to call it, the International School of Political, you know, the Economic School and the Political Science School didn't merge, so they didn't have a stipend for me. And I was more than glad to continue with my PhD, but I had to pay for it. And I said, I'm already in bachelor debt, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I'm going to now have to actually get a job. Speaking as candid and transparently as possible, I was now alone in West Palm Beach. I had all my options taken away from me and I had a bachelor degree and I'm working at Starbucks and don't want to do that anymore. And I got somewhat intoxicated that night, put together a resume, spammed it on Craigslist. And the next morning I got a phone call from my previous firm that I was at for almost 12 years. And, um, they pitched me on what they were doing. It started interesting. I joined. And the rest was history. And that's how I joined the medical device industry. You've basically lived a couple of lives already before you joined the medtech industry. That's actually fascinating. I guess in, in all of that, has that given you, uh, I guess, perspective or a reason to stick with medtech? Or has have those previous experiences just been like, okay, well, I'm done with living life that hard now. I'm just going to stick with this one thing and master it for what's been more than a decade now. Uh so I ended up joining technically the medical device industry when I was 23 years old. So all yep. that very long story that I just shared happened in a fairly short amount of time, actually, in retrospect. And I was also incredibly young. So when I joined, I was 23 when I joined the medical device industry. It was an almost immediate obsession. It was certainly an immediate love. And then going back to my love for school, I was in the industry for two years before I wanted to go back to school in some fashion. I didn't want to give up what I was doing. I wanted to do a degree on the side. And so I was like, okay, fine, makes sense. I'm, what was it now? I'm 23 years old. So I was 20, almost 25 at the time, I guess. And so I said, I'm going to go get an MBA, right? That's what people do, I guess, when you're in business and, you know, I guess so. I guess so. So, but I got talked out of it. I and mean, people are like, you're still really young. I mean, I understand if you did an MBA that was associated and tacked down right to your bachelor's, but if not, you're still really young. You have a couple of years of experience. My firm was like, I'm not paying for your MBA. This is not one of those companies. So if you are doing an MBA, it's out of your own pocket. And so I started getting some feedback being like, do you really want to invest a quarter million dollars into something that you're probably going to get a lot more out of when you're five or maybe 10 years older? Like, fair point. I'll listen. And I didn't get an MBA, but I still wanted to go to school. And then I said, well, what degree could I possibly get that would keep me entertained, but also even augment or help me out with my current career? And so I found the master's degree with a focal point in medical device coming from Northeastern University up in Boston. And then you could do it online or remote, but you can go back and forth. And um, that's what I did. And so I said, well, regulatory, and now I fast forward through the degree, I have a, an amazing appreciation for regulatory affairs professionals, because honestly, regulations hits every facet of every function of a medical device company or a medical device technology. So what regulations you're aware of from an R&D perspective, design history files and everything else that needs to be in place from a regulatory standpoint, which is quality assurance and then clinical trials and then manufacturing and, and then even sales, you know, there's regulations that apply to all these different functions. So if you understand regulatory affairs, you fundamentally have a greater insight as to how it controls or influences every facet of a product's life cycle based on, once again, R&D through commercialization. And so I'm like, oh, fine, that's like my one-stop shop. I because actually what I did ultimately try to do before doing that um, regulatory affairs degree was actually see if I can get an engineering degree because I have a love for engineering, maybe in my next life, not this life. 
but engineering is cool. I love engineering. And uh, I decided that I wanted to pursue an engineering degree, but couldn't, I found out that between the labs and everything else, I couldn't have a full-time job and do that. So I was doing, you know, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. with my job. And then I would go home and walk my dog and then do my master's from eight until 11 o'clock at night and then do it all over again. And I did that for two and a half years and then had an amazing appreciation for regulatory affairs in the medical device industry, which even further augmented my love for the industry. And uh, fast forward a bunch of a lot of stuff. I'm never leaving this industry. You'd have to drag me out kicking and screaming. Why do you love it so much? Oh, man. Um, so if you haven't figured out already, I'm very direct and transparent and things like that. So it came from what I love, but, you know, blue collar family, right? I mean, not too many people in my family went to university. And wildly successful as entrepreneurs themselves. So I came from an entrepreneurial family. My, my family owned hair salons. Um, you wouldn't know it because I'm bald. But you know, my grandfather to this day still has a full head of hair. My father has a full head of hair. I don't know what happened to me, but anyway, they're hairstylists and they're, they're very successful, wildly hair, wildly successful hairstylists, as well as salon owners. So, you know, I grew up sweeping the floors and all that stuff, but I, I know what elbow grease looks and feels like. So why stay in? Um, you know, coming from a fairly blue collar background and then entering into a world where everyone at a minimum has a degree, most people have multiple degrees. There's regulatory facets, there's clinical trials, medical devices are an iterative technology sector versus the binary technology sector with biopharma, it either works or it doesn't. There's constant iterations happening, which means it's constantly evolving, which means it's constantly getting better, hopefully, fingers crossed. This is one of those things where if you're a lover of learning, a lover of education, and you're constantly seeking a destination, meaning, you know, you want to learn it all. And then once you get there, maybe you have the luxury of trying to learn something else. You will constantly be chasing your own carrot in this industry whether it's entrepreneurship, clinical, class three devices, the difference between class three and class one devices, software as a medical device, surgical robotics, implantable neuromodulation, transcatheter heart valves versus surgical heart valves, how to commercialize outside the United States, what's the regulatory strategy that saves capital and time on investing into a company that's ultimately going to lead to a potential successful exit and who are the strategics going to buy it on and on and on and on and on. There is an unlimited, seemingly unlimited facets, amount of facets in this industry. And there's so much information that you could possibly learn and you'll never learn it all. So you'll always be chasing your carrot. And if you're a lover of education and learning and a student of life and a forever student, and you happen to like cool technology that saves lives, tell me a better industry to be in. You've sold me on it. What's the name of the university again? <laughs> university of Life. University of Life and Clinical Device University. All right. All right. Well, I, I, I got I to gotta look into those degrees because that sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah. I mean. Well, the university that I got my medical Yes. Life. Yes. North, Northeastern. So at okay. This, at the, when the time that I did it, it came on, it, I don't want to say it was new. It was around for maybe a few years ish, but not many, but there was a very select few of, of universities that were offering a regulatory affairs masters. Yeah. Yeah. There was what I think one out of Southern California, Boston, but there was very, very, very few, I think certainly less than a handful. At this point, you'll find more universities offering masters of regulatory affairs. However, if anyone loves the medical device industry, and you could do it in life science as well. Um, I just chose the major focal track. You have to learn biotech, pharma, and medical device, but you can focus in one as you continue to do your classes. I chose medical devices because that's my industry that I chose to want to be in. Uh, you can choose one of the other two as well, or three. 
So anyway, I did mine at Northeastern University of Boston, and I happen to have a huge love of Boston because basically Boston is Buffalo on steroids. So I feel like I'm home when I'm there too. That's fair enough. I mean, you didn't end up in just regulatory. In fact, a lot of your previous interviews uh, focus on the work that you do when it comes to working with people. And your work now is basically finding the right people for startups in the med tech field and also finding the right funding for these startups, if I'm not incorrect. So if you can share with me, what's the, what's a, I guess, high level overview of the process that you go through to find the right people for the right positions in the med tech field? Cool. Uh, big question. So fundamentally what we do is, and not to overcomplicate the story, because I think the story at this point can somewhat seem complicated. Like I get pushed back fairly regularly on, wow, you do a lot of things. And I really want to course correct that message because I happen to be able to do a lot of things at this point, because when you focus so hard and so intensely in one industry and you're a voracious networker, which is really all I do anyway, and you're in it for as long as I have been, it gives you the networking superpower to be able to do a lot of things because you just happen to have a network. However, to course correct all that confusion, I am a medical device recruiter, talent acquisition specialized firm, building team, designing teams, 100% and solely for medical device or med tech startup. What is med tech? It's regulated hardware and or software. Anything that has to report to the CDRH division of the FDA, that's me. We'll get involved into combination products as well. It just happens to be lesser of the volume. Uh, but to course correct, I, we build teams. We're, we're a talent acquisition firm. But when you do that over and over and over again, and you specialize only in the startup, I don't work with Johnson & Johnson. I don't work with Boston Scientific or Medtronic or Abbott or Edwards. I try to understand and keep up with their portfolios and doing what they're doing and or learning what they're doing and also who they're acquiring. So I have to understand this corporate strategic story because ultimately that's where the commercialized products fundamentally lie for our, health, our greater healthcare system. But all of my clients, all of my focus is med tech startup, entrepreneurs, this startup ecosystem. And so when you are only focused in startups, you have to understand how to build those startups again, milestone. And also more importantly, we'll get to the purpose of milestones. After many, many years of these startups being like, Hey man, I know you're specialized in our field. Just wanted to touch base with you because we're going to be closing around hopefully anywhere between the next month, three months, year, whatever it may be, but wanted just to get to know you because when we do get that cash, I want to help partner with you so that we can build our team together and get, get going. And so, okay, great. Well, you let me know when you're ready. When you get that cash, when you close on that capital, I'm here for you whenever you, whenever you need. And so I just started telling myself, I'm like, what am I waiting for? And it just took me many, too many years. How many times do I have to put a reminder on the calendar to reach back out to that company to see if they've raised their capital? Why don't I just start helping them? And what gave me somewhat of a, a little bridge to be able to ask that question and then be able to really put the pressure on doing that was I started getting hired by venture capital firms to put in new CEOs into their portfolio companies that they invested in. Obviously, once founders align with their new board of investors and they're like, okay, let's get a new CEO in here to take over, that's when they would hire. So I would come in and I would put in these CEOs, but along the way, you're building relationships with the VC that have hired you, as well as the company that you're putting the new CEO in. CEO in. And so I didn't have a robust network. I mean, a handful of VCs that I've worked with over the years. And I just called him up one day and I said, listen, I know nothing. I am reaching out to you as a friend. I know we've spent time together putting in CEOs for your companies before. I need 15 minutes if you got it, half hour if you'll give it. I know nothing about the other side of the table. What does it really mean to invest in medical device companies? What does it mean to raise capital from an entrepreneur's perspective, which then led me to my next little project of asking entrepreneurs and simply asking, 
What does it feel like? What do you even have to do? When you go out and raise capital, is it, what does that process look like? And I just started asking both sides of the table. And then once I had a pretty decent deal uh, or uh, uh, amount of jargon and lexicon of being able to speak capital raising, I started reaching out to investors and say, hey, listen, I have a tremendous amount of deal flow. I see startups all the time. I work with most of them, but some of them are still waiting on money. And if I can understand what your fund looks like, meaning what do you invest in, minimum check size, all that good stuff, I'll simply just make introductions. I mean, it benefits everyone, right? Those startups ultimately get the money. Great. Now they can come spend it on me and we can go build their teams. They get the money to go run their operations, meaning the startups themselves, and, and move forward the technology that they set out to do. And the investors get curated deal flow. They get to see technologies that they may have not been aware of before. So it's, it's a win-win. I'm not an investment banker. I don't charge money for this. I don't collect the success-based fee off of this. It is simply paying it forward, which is one of my differentiators um, as a recruiter. And that was kind of where the fork in the road happened. And that's where the complex story starts coming in. So fast forward a bunch of years, we design full teams. We can do, once again, your independent board members. We can hire your CEOs. We can work with those CEOs and hire R&D teams all the way through commercial teams from C-level down to entry level. We're a one-stop shop. That's how we build teams. But over the years of doing that 10,000 times and then having this investor network, we're now able to make those introductions to those startups, to the investors. I think over light, slightly less than a handful of years at this point, we've helped facilitate a little bit more than 300 million for about 74 companies. Wow. And counting. And that's like one of those weird things where if you and I did this podcast in a month or three months or four months, the number would change because the, all this pipeline that's happening where all these introductions that have happened over the course and I make very high volume introductions on a weekly basis. If you look at a statistical level, most of them are highly unsuccessful. It's making introduction, but the ones that hit, then they hit and everyone wins. So that's what we do in terms of how we actually recruit. I mean, I'll, I'll let you jump in if you have any more molecular questions, but in terms of designing of teams, it's, it's understanding what the problem is, going out and finding the candidates, running a very white glove service, becoming best friends with the hiring managers. It could be the CEO. It could be the vice president of R and D. It could be the director of quality, whoever's hiring, but we're very invasive. I mean, I have all of my hiring managers, mobile phone numbers in my phone, and this is not a nine to five job. And it's not a formal, let me disappear for four weeks, come back with five candidates and hire one. I am texting you on Saturday morning. I am email blasting you on Sunday night. I am asking for feedback on the candidate that I submitted 10 minutes ago on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, it is a very iterative process, almost like building a medical device, but just much higher volume and very fast. And we drive and drive and drive and educate the process with our hiring managers until they're ready to make an offer. And then we're very instrumental in being that insightful data sharer on helping them negotiate a proper offer to ultimately land the person that they want. And as a recruiter, I really don't have any met many metrics of successes, um, except obviously it has the hire been made, but one of the metrics of successes that we do pride ourselves on, which is driving that very thorough process is acceptance rates. If I have a client, a singular client or multiple clients, and we look at 10 offers being made, whether it's, you know, a couple offers with a company or 10 individual offers. If I'm only good for having four of those offers out of the 10 accepted, I'm doing something wrong. My job is to create a process that's so airtight, overly communicative, everyone alignment are aligned on in terms of understanding of where everyone is in terms of interests, compensation, expectations, et cetera, so that by the time that the offer comes out, there should be no surprises. Like the ink should be dry pretty damn quick. That's my, that's my metric. And if I fail at that, 
that's what I should be held accountable to. Thank you for the very in-depth answer. I really appreciate it. Um, you, you really gave quite a bit of detail there, but for those who are, I guess, less familiar with the, the equation that I've seen on your website, as well as which embodies a lot of your work, money plus people equals milestones. Can you explain what that means as you would to a five-year-old? Great question. So once someone has an idea to start a medical device company, it, it starts with a human being, right? It's, it's a shower idea, it's a napkin idea. There's no money involved. It's nothing but an idea. There's this growing, very early first days of the idea of growing pain, though it usually is people, we'll call them founders, bootstrapping, working for free, moonlighting, whatever it may be. But once that phase is over, once that founder, very, very first days of foundership is over, they have to look outside for something, for more people, for more money, or money in general. They have to look outside. There, ha there is a threshold point where founders have to look outside. I mean, unless you're some already multiple serial entrepreneur who's made a billion dollars personally and you can seed your own company and, right? I mean, that, those are very few exceptions in between. But typically, the founders come together as human beings and then they have to look outside. 99.9% .9 of the time, that is for money first, because they need that money to do what they're doing for whatever that founding team looks like, but then they need to then eventually start building a team, right? So typically, and like I alluded to before, all these startups that I would be working with that eventually were like, I would love to work with you. I would love for you to build my team. I just need to close on my series A. I, I need to close on my series B in a couple of weeks and I'll give you a call. So money comes first. And once they have that money, it's not like three people in a garage who close on a series B of 30 million stop right there and they just execute on that $30 million to go hit that next milestone of, is it first in man? Is it running and successfully closing a hundred person clinical trial and taking that data set and writing a PMA and submitting that to the FDA and getting approval and then all of a sudden they're ready to commercialize? And no. When you close that 30 million, the first thing that you do is start going out and hiring people because you need that human capital, that human resource to come in and then start delegating micro or focused tasks to then satiate the greater good to then hit that milestone. Because when you're raising that capital, when those founders or whatever stage at the company is at, that CEO or that founder is looking into the eyes of the investor and they're pitching a story, which is usually all that they have, typically speaking, wrapped around a product. And they're saying, Mr. or Mrs. Investor, if you give me this money, this is the value creation that I will create with that money, which is not jumping right to the end line. It's jumping to a milestone. If I raise a $10 million Series A for a Class 3 device, I am hoping that I get to design freeze and maybe a first-in-man test. Go through VNV, a design freeze. I put it maybe in one human or if just right before what you and I got to go raise a series B to get there, right? But you're telling a story as to what series A is going to get me. Then it's on the operational execution team to drive to that milestone, utilizing that money that they raised so that then they have their next milestone in sight and the story repeats. So after the founders, they go out and raise capital money. Once they get that money, they hire people so that they can have the resources to hit the milestone. So money plus people equals milestone. And you have that on repeat until an exit, which is either an IPO going public, an acquisition, or unfortunately closing the doors and it's a failure. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. It was, it was really insightful, but I think there were some words in there that a five-year-old wouldn't understand. Uh, <laughs> I got to refine my pitch story that I got to work on. All right. Well, we'll come back when, uh, when you have that. But um, you, you started this firm. You've mentioned a couple of times already. 
and it's called Lifeblood Capital. What's behind the name? Love it. I love telling the story. So I host a podcast called MedTech Money, where we demystify raising and investing capital in MedTech. The goal of the podcast, and I hate even using the word podcast, I, I wanted to create this educational platform, this body of work where, yes, there is significant value in each episode, but the greater value is the collective body of work where an entrepreneur who has literally zero clue of raising capital can go in the medical device industry and understand the nuances of raising capital at early stages, later stages. What's the nuances between raising money for software versus hardware, class three versus class one? What's it like to raise from an angel group versus family offices versus family and friends versus institutional investors versus corporate venture? And all the answers from the perspectives of whoever my guests are would be there. And so now we're upwards of 110 episodes and it's investors telling their stories. It's entrepreneurs telling their stories. And my opening question that I ask all of them is, do you believe that people and money are the lifeblood of a med tech startup? Ah. What is the lifeblood of a med tech startup? And it's either validation of the first question or unsolicitedly, they say people and money are the lifeblood of medtech startups, or for that matter, people and money are the med are the lifeblood of any startup. We just happen to be in medtech. So then it's a play on word capital, right? Is it financial capital? Is it human capital? So if we agree that the lifeblood of a startup is people and money, and our business is talent acquisition and fundraising strategies of helping startups find that capital or lifeblood capital. Clever, clever. I appreciate it. That, that's, a, that's a very, very good name. Thank you. I love um, it. So in your previous podcast, you've also talked about uh, good and bad capital on the topic of capital. I know we've only got a few minutes left, but really briefly, What's the difference between the two? Partnerships. If you, if you hear the podcast that I've been able to record, if you talk to entrepreneurs who have raised capital successfully and ask them their opinion and ask that exact same question, raising capital from investors is entering a marriage, likely a shorter term marriage than a lifelong marriage, but it's a marriage. And when you are, especially a first time entrepreneur and you are diehard passionate about the technology that you've either thought of and created or a CEO who has taken over a very early stage idea and are now tasked with raising capital to keep the doors open and continuously developing the, the company, you don't necessarily think about what goes beyond taking the check and you are desperate for money. And I use that word lightly, I guess, because there are times where you're simply saying to yourself, I know what I need to do. I know the next milestone I need to hit. It's a, I, I simply need the money. Someone give me the money so I can go back to doing what I know I need to do. And if you look at it that way, you start looking at money coming from anywhere. And that could be a severe problem because once you take bad money from a, an investor and they're on your cap table or they're on your board or they're on your board of advisors and they have different agendas or they drive timelines differently than you or they want to out you as the founder and CEO or they want to bring in somebody because there's political things that you don't understand in the background. You don't know. There could be a plethora of reasons. Bad money can literally kill a company. And so, yes, it's fundamentally and superficially money up front. Fine. Go on your bank account, on your online bank, and you can see the money deposited in there. Great. You got money. But when you have to answer to the person who gave you that money and they don't align with 
the vision of the company that the founders or the CEO is trying to drive for, it brings incredible conflict, which is heavily distracting for the operations of the company and can kill the company. You, you quickly learn throughout the capital raising process, especially if you're a successful entrepreneur who's transacted and you've been through this wholeheartedly, um, or even just raised a, a round or two and you've been through it or had a, bo a bad board of directors. Good money is supportive, value added experience, contacts, network, and execution that's given to the company to help foster and develop the company in addition to the capital that they give you. Neutral money is someone who loves the story, believes in you, writes you a check and purposely disappears. They're not good. They're not bad. They don't have an agenda. They don't have an opinion. They're just sitting on the sidelines watching either this thing take off like a rocket or crash like a race car. <laughs> so, um, that's the difference between bad, neutral, and good money. Good money is capital plus value added experience, wisdom, context, network. Neutral money is what I just shared with, they don't have an agenda. They're just capital and they move on and they don't really have an opinion. And bad money, um, if not vetted out pro properly, can tank your company. And it's not just money, it's money with an opinion. And if it doesn't align with yours, it's detrimental. And so if you're an entrepreneur raking capital, it, just remember it's a two-way street, it's a marriage, and you may be desperate for cash, but sometimes it's better not to take that cash, even if it hurts. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're, we're basically at time to close up now, but before we close up, you've talked a lot about the work that you've done. Um, is there anything new that the listeners can look forward to that you will be doing in the future, especially in the context of uh, an inflationary economy that is difficult to, to raise a startup in as capital would be scarce. Oh man, Th there is, we actually have a, a, a really long-term vision, which is actually not that long-term, which is super exciting. And I'm very excited to get there. Um, it, what I can allude to the fact is it's a very natural progression of where we're heading, right? So. Um, we are a talent acquisition firm. We're never going to stop that. That is where we are and will always be. But being at this epicenter of the entrepreneurial ecosystem and be now being able to make those introductions and help those entrepreneurs find money, and then you have that built-in deal flow and you have those syndication partners and you have a value add in terms of a skill set to a startup that you could help, I'll let you paint the rest of the picture of where we might be headed and, and keep that as a little bit of a surprise, but um, I'm very excited about that next step and journey. And All right. A couple other communal building projects that we're going to be doing um, this year, 2023, uh, with the entrepreneur in mind and, and keeping that ecosystem and community together and impactfully demystifying a few things, as well as sharing free content with the entrepreneur to help them in that awfully hard journey of building a medical device startup company. Awesome. Well, thank you for painting that picture. With that, we'll end off. Thanks for coming on, Gio. Really appreciate it. You can find How It's Met at any, I guess, podcast that you listen to. And you can also listen to MedTech Money um, at any podcatcher as well. Am I correct? You are correct. All right. Until next time. Thank you so much, Jeff.